Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar hosted by the Collaborative Conservation and Adaptation Strategy Toolbox, or CCAST. Uh, my name is Matt Graybaugh, and I work for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services Science Applications Program. I am our at-risk species coordinator for Arizona and New Mexico, coming to you from Tucson, Arizona. I'm also the federal co-director of the Collaborative Conservation and Adaptation Strategy Toolbox, or CCAST, uh, which I already mentioned. Uh, CCAST is a platform for peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange and co-production of decision support tools on key management challenges such as, such as introduced aquatic species. The CCAST partnership supports different communities of practice, including the non-native non aquatic species community of practice, which we launched in May of 2020, and that's why we're here. Uh, if you'd like more information on CCAST overall or the different communities of practice that we facilitate, please feel free to reach out to me or Christy, uh, your CCAST representatives um, on the webinar today. We have a ton of work ongoing um, within non-native aquatics alone. We have uh, this web series, of course, uh, multiple case studies in development and a continuing and kind of growing effort to coordinate on American bullfrog control work in the West. Uh, so lots going on, um, but for now we should probably get going with the webinar for today. So I'll pass the mic over to Christy to introduce our speakers. Thank you, Matt. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Christy Miner. I'm the coordinator for the Non-Native Aquatic Species Community of Practice here at CCAST. Webinars like today's are one way that we facilitate peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange. And today we're very excited to host a presentation from Ted Grossholtz and Stephanie Green, who will discuss a framework for developing practical guidelines to identify quantitative targets for mitigating the impacts of aquatic invasive species. Dr. Grossholtz is a professor and the Alexander and Elizabeth Swans Specialist in Cooperative Extension at the University of California, Davis. He is a benthic marine ecologist whose work includes quantifying and managing the impacts of aquatic invasive species in coastal ecosystems. He's participated on several panels addressing invasive species management, including the National Research Council and the Canadian Aquatic Invasive Species Network. Dr. Green is an assistant professor and the Canada Research Chair in Aquatic Global Change Ecology and Conservation at the University of Alberta. Her research uses field studies and experiments, quantitative models and stakeholder surveys to understand how biological invasions impact natural resources. She has studied several aquatic invaders, including the ecological effects and management of invasive lionfish in the Western Atlantic. And just a final reminder for, for everyone before I turn it over, um, if you have questions during the presentation, please just enter them into the chat box and I will relay them to the speakers after the presentation. And with that, um, I will hand it over to you, Ted. Okay, well, thanks to uh, Christy and to Matt for the invitation today, and uh, I'll acknowledge my co-author Stephanie in just a second. Um, thank everyone for tuning in, and we're going to talk to you about functional eradication, new approach that we've been developing for managing aquatic invasive species. So here we go. I'm going to, whoops, uh-oh, that was a mistake. Hold on. Hit the wrong button there. Can everyone see this? Good. Thanks. So we are we are uh, talking about managing a whole range of aquatic invasive species, and we're developing a model that we think can apply to a broad range of species and a way in which it will empower management to come up with better approaches to managing these invasive species. I want to acknowledge Steph who will be coming on and then uh, talk a little bit later and myself. So this is very much a collaboration. So I uh, want to sort of make sure that that's clear throughout this. Okay. Oops. So today's talk, we're going to be discussing some surveys that we undertook to really ask questions of managers in, U in the US and Canada about how they approach managing invasive species. And then we'll sort of outline functional eradication as a way of doing this and a way of setting goals for uh, this type of management. We'll do so by developing a couple case studies, the European green crab and the Indo-Pacific lionfish and discuss how data that managers already have can be used to develop uh, quantitative goals for these kinds of uh, this kind of management. And we'll talk about which species we think this would be best uh, developed for. Uh, 
and we'll take some questions at the end. So uh, send them to the chat and Christy will, will take care of those. So of course, this is, there's a global invasive species database with literally many, many hundreds of species. Uh, aquatic invasive species are some of the most notorious. Uh, several are on the world's 100 invasive species, 100 worst invasive species list. And the question really is, you know, what to do, how population control can be undertaken. So eradication, complete eradication, has been, of course, one tool that managers use. And we'll talk about where that's most likely to be uh, successful and where it may not be. And then the question is, well, if full eradication isn't going to be successful, what, what's the way forward in this case? Um, so we're gonna sort of talk about um, some population models that, um, you know, that of course can identify mortality rates needed to do this. This is of course, you know, a well-published idea. So you need to be able to undertake this at some length to be able to conduct this. Now, of course, that's gonna work in places under some circumstances where you actually can fully remove the species. So these would be places like, you know, small islands. Again, these are places where eradication, of course, has been successful with a very restricted geographic range. So you have a, a small pool, if you will, to have to undertake uh, eradication. If it's a very small population size to start with, of course, you know, some plants you can see species like this. There's not a great deal of work to do to get rid of it, especially early in introductions. Habitats that are readily accessible, obviously you can move across the habitat here easily and find invaders wherever they might be, whatever species you're undertaking. Invaders that are easily removed. So obviously this uh, squirrel is uh, a sitting duck or a sitting squirrel, so that would be an easy target for removal. However, aquatic invasions are really quite different. So that um, you can see here, this is very uh, uh, complicated maze of estuaries and channels. Of course, it'd be very difficult to get a species uh, eradicated from this habitat. Um, open ocean or even near shore coastal areas and bays, of course, are extremely difficult because you can't necessarily see what's below the water. So there's a whole quantity or category of uh, invasions where this is going to be very, very difficult. So um, we wanna discuss where and how we can do this. And at this point, what we'll talk about is a way of managing um, invaders, but trying to understand what's already going on, what managers are already doing. So, um, so the questions are, you know, what are the top invasions that the managers are considering? What are, are the species that are of most concern? Um, what has been their impact? What are the goals of management for these species? And how are they being achieved? So we, you know, in order to understand where we need to go, we need to understand what's currently being done and who's doing it and how they're doing it. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Steph, who's gonna explain um, a survey set of survey tools that we use to try to answer these sorts of questions. So I'm gonna stop sharing and Steph is going to start sharing. You ready? Okay, here we go. Or you're on mute, Steph. You wanna go off mute, there we go. Hi, everyone. Yeah, I'm gonna share my screen now. Pick up where Ted left off. So as, as Ted said, we've um, been doing deep dives in our own work and in our collaborations into population control for um, invasive species, particularly in aquatic environments. And um, our experience has really highlighted the context in which um, eradication may not necessarily be feasible, but we really wanted to know whether um, you know, the case studies that we have been working on um, resonated with others, both in the science community and also in the large community of practice focused on aquatic invasive species, um, particularly in the US and also in Canada where we're both based. And so we set out to conduct a bi-national survey to try and understand um, what the current practices around aquatic invasive species management were and the goals of that management and the information that was input into that. So we launched a bi-national survey targeted to folks um, in management across different sectors and released that survey via Qualtrics software a few years ago. Um, this was a survey that we tried to keep quite short down to 15 minutes or less. And we sent this out via um, 
the aquatic invasive species um, regional panels that are um, sort of under the national task force uh, focused on aquatic invasive species, as well as conducting snowball sampling, which is basically an approach where those that take the survey suggest others who are relevant in the community um, working on this issue. And then we continue that type of sampling until we start to get the same names back. So what did we learn from this effort? Um, well, we had a, a lot of interest and responses, almost 250 um, managers and practitioners throughout the six sort of regions, which includes, um, the panels also include Canada within this, a lot of responses from around sort of this um, bi-national area. And the breakdown of respondents um, was interesting in that we had mostly folks who are working on this issue from within government, both federal, state, and local government, um, making management decisions and also enacting management plans and activities for aquatic invasive species. We also had some participation from folks working in the nonprofit space, um, private sector, and also, of course, some university researchers that are, that are liaising and collaborating on this work as well. When we looked at the species that this community was focused on, a number of sort of key aquatic invaders came to light as the top priorities for identifying some sort of um, strategy for informing population control. So many respondents were focused on zebra or quagga mussels. We had um, a range of different sort of life histories and taxonomic groups represented from Eurasian water milfoil to Asian carp to the lionfish and green crab. So both freshwater, estuarine and marine invasions were highlighted across, across the responses as um, invasions of primary concern for management activities. When we asked our respondents what they were doing in this space, we asked them to characterize whether their activities were focused primarily on prevention, so preventing establishment of a population, eradication, so completely removing the population, extirpating it down to a level um, where it's not sustainable anymore, containment, perhaps just restricting the geographic spread of a particular invader, or um, sort of the most uh, extreme would be suppression, where you have a, an established invasion and you're not aiming for eradication, but you're, you're really just looking to keep densities um, to a low level. When we asked our respondents about the strategies they were using, overwhelmingly um, respondents said that the invasions they were primarily focused on, those, those um, key invaders, had established and spread beyond ranges at which eradication was possible. So eradication was, which is in the dark blue bars here, um, is um, not the primary strategy that's being used. In fact, it's containment or often suppression that managers are, are focusing on. We asked um, this group of respondents what um, information they had to make decisions about the work that they were doing. And while 80% of them said that invasions were occurring at a scale beyond the resources they had for eradication, so in that containment or suppression area, 98% of our respondents that were focused on either containment or suppression said they didn't really have targets for suppression that were based on some quantitative metrics of how the system would respond. So the question is then, okay, well, how much suppression is enough? How do we find and use the information necessary to know when we've done enough in the system to try and keep one of these key invasive species in check? Um, and in particular, uh, from causing damage within the native ecosystem or uh, suppression that would allow for recovery of whatever the valued resource or, or biodiversity component might be. And so um, the way that we have sort of been conceiving of how one might be able to go about setting targets for um, invasive species control along this sort of spectrum of activities, if we think of um, prevention as being where we have sort of a few individuals introduced and we've got enough resources to be able to prevent that establishment and populations that establish being able to be eradicated if they're small or isolated or um, easily findable and removable as, as Ted discussed. Um, those are where we might use some of the sort of traditional science that's done in invasion biology to try and inform management. So creating those single species population models that just tells us how much harvest or mortality we need to have 
to place the population into decline because our really our goal is to extirpate or eradicate that population. However, as we start to move into this idea of containment or suppression, that typical sort of um, scientific approach where we've where we generated models isn't isn't as um, isn't may not be as useful any longer because our goal has shifted. We're no longer just seeking to identify mortality targets. We're interested in properties of the system that we want to maintain while we have the invader present at some level. And so this is where we propose a shift in thinking from um, what we call numerical eradication towards functional eradication. And I'll discuss that in just a second. Here, we're essentially setting targets for suppression and high priority areas with the goal of protecting key ecosystem components with the limited resources that we have. Essentially, a way of sort of going about allocating those limited management resources to have maximum impact on whatever our um, conservation or management objective is. So what does this actually look like? It's great to see a schematic, but how might this actually work in practice? So as we're proposing a shift from numerical eradication to functional eradication, um, this might involve what we see as sort of three key steps. The first of which is actually identifying the mechanisms by which the um, focal invasive species has impact on the recipient ecosystem. So be it predation or competition with native species or um, crowding out for habitat space or um, replacing sort of certain functions within the system. The second of which is to link the densities or the abundance of the invader to that characteristic or property um, of the effects that they have. So linking essentially the density and the impact of the invader. And then considering whether or not there are thresholds in that relationship that be, could be used to guide management and also whether that's feasible in terms of the repopulation of the invader itself as you do the control. So certain types of information are uh, really useful for actually um, operationalizing this type of a functional eradication approach. We asked the managers that we spoke with in the survey about some common types of information that could be used in this framework. The first of which is information on the population densities of the aquatic um, invasive species or ANS as it's called in the top left panel. Uh, information on the ecological impacts that that invasive species is having, having in the system that they study impacts on native taxa that are present and also socioeconomic impact data are all useful to try and link populations of the invader to um, the effects they're having in the system. And as you can see here, actually many of the practitioners we spoke with are already gathering these types of monitoring data within their jurisdiction, in particular data on um, the abundances of the invasive species and on the ecological effects or even just um, impacts to native taxa. A majority of uh, respondents said that there were some data that existed. And that's great news for leveraging that information to be able to set up um, a functional eradication approach. So now Ted and I wanna take you through two case studies that we have um, been working in in close collaboration with local partners to further illustrate how you might actually operationalize using this type of monitoring information to set functional eradication targets for um, an invasion of interest. The case study I wanna take you through is the Indo-Pacific lionfish. It's a marine invader that is present um, throughout the Western Atlantic Ocean and it has colonized um, coastal habitats across the uh, Eastern US and also Caribbean territories of the US as well. And um, it's pictured here, it's a beautiful charismatic uh, aquarium fish that has been transported globally from its native range in the Indian Pacific Oceans throughout the world and is now causing quite an invasion in the Western Atlantic as well as the Mediterranean Sea. This is um, one of the distribution maps for uh, lionfish in its non-native range in the Western Atlantic Ocean. The red dots report sightings of the species to the USGS um, non-Indigenous Aquatic Species Database. I've just taken a screenshot from 2015 because the red dots just get more dense. The area doesn't necessarily get, um, the, the geographic spread hasn't necessarily uh, increased, but it, the densities have increased. Um, and as you can see, they're established along coastlines bordering a number of states in the US, as well as a number of territories and countries within um, 
the tropical Western Atlantic and Caribbean basin. Densities of lionfish in this region have increased exponentially following colonization to the point where this species is one of the most abundant species of its size class and trophic position on habitats where it has become invasive. And numerous studies have documented the ecological effects of this new fish predator um, on the native ecosystems that it finds itself in in the Western Atlantic. Um, one of the uh, roles I've had the privilege of playing is uh, in facilitating management planning throughout this region, both in US territories as well as internationally. And one of the key questions here has been, what is the approach going to be to managing lionfish given that, um, given that they have such a wide range and they're so abundant? Manual removal of the species um, by spearfishing and by harvest through nets is sort of the primary approach to population control for this species. And when we brought managers and scientists together from across US states as well as internationally to share lessons, one main thing became clear, complete eradication was really not what the objective was for, um, for population control of this species. Really what we were looking at was a suppression or a functional eradication strategy given the broad geographic range of the species, which is indicated here in red, which is based on thermal limits and the huge range of habitat types that they occupy. So key questions for our management partners became what level of population reduction is sufficient to control the impacts of these uh, invasive uh, predators in the system? How can those efforts be sustained given that there will always be some lionfish in the system? And where should we prioritize these efforts? So I want to focus in on using um, very particular, very specific, I should say, monitoring data that partners had um, and that we gathered together from various regions um, that were invaded by lionfish to try and set targets for population reduction based on a functional eradication approach. And so what I'm going to show you here is two quantitative relationships that are really integral to functional eradication. The top panel on the left, I'm showing you uh, the relationship between lionfish density and densities on that y-axis and lionfish per hectares. And on the top panel, its relationship with the proportional change in native fish biomass. So this is the density impact relationship for lionfish, how, how lionfish numbers impact native species through consumption because they're a predator. The bottom panel is another key relationship that we want to know as we're setting out and evaluating whether this is a good candidate for functional eradication. And that is the relationship between lionfish densities and how quickly they recolonize uh, a site after we've done our control. Now there's a couple of different potential relationships that could exist between these important properties. The first is which is we have, could have linear relationships. For example, in the top panel, as lionfish densities go up, we could see that there is a steady decline in perhaps the biomass of native fish, the prey that lionfish would consume. And we could also see in the bottom panel, for example, a linear relationship between lionfish density and how quickly they recolonize a site after we've done removal. So the more lionfish we have in an area, the quicker they're going to come back to a site after we've called that particular location. But we know from a lot of other ecology research and, and domains of, um, of management experiments, I'll say, in the system, that relationships often aren't linear in the natural world. And what we might actually see is some nonlinear relationships, such that, for example, in the top panel, we might see a threshold above which lionfish densities actually start to have a really rapid impact on native species in the system, but that at low densities, there really isn't too much of a change. We might also see that there's a nonlinear relationship between lionfish densities and how quickly they recolonize an area. So for example, at low densities of the invader, we might actually see really um, uh, increasing return on the number of individuals that come back to an area um, because we've released, for example, density dependent processes that might be inhibiting our recolonization of that site. And above a certain density, we might see that actually uh, we have lower rates of recolonization because those habitats are already full of lionfish and we're not going to see um, increasing rates of them coming back. So what do the data actually show us when we look at our monitoring um, information for this particular species in areas that are invaded? Well, what we actually see for lionfish is a very strong nonlinear relationship, both in terms of their density 
and impact relationship and in their density and recolonization rela relationship, such that if we estimate um, the relationship for lionfish, keeping them at or below about um, 25 to 50 individuals per hectare is going to reduce the impacts on native species and also mean that we won't have um, super fast recolonization of the species to the area. So our recommendation would he be here that we have a target that we can try and achieve. We don't need to remove every single lionfish from a site in order to maintain the ecological integrity of the system. And we don't necessarily need to be uh, concerned that if we remove lionfish from the system that we're going to have these um, really increasing compensatory recolonization processes happening. So these sorts of targets are actually being implemented in a few regions. And one case study I wanna highlight just in this slide to wrap up this section is linking these um, thresholds for management, these functional eradication targets with um, social and ecological um, outcomes for coastal and marine protected areas in Belize. So this is a partnership with um, the Belize Fisheries Department, a number of nonprofits, and also with funding from the United Nations Environmental Program that is linking essentially suppressing the densities of lionfish to these sort of targeted um, levels with um, allowing harvest of the fish for economic gain by local fishers communities. So it's that benefit of keeping lionfish in check as well as incentivizing removal and sustaining it through local engagement. And the idea here is to link those targets and um, at the end of the day, protect native and rare species that are found in the region. Okay, that's it for my portion. I'm now gonna turn it over to Ted to talk a little bit about the European green crab as a case study. Okay. All right, I'm gonna go ahead. Once you stop sharing stuff and I'll go ahead and share mine. Okay. And let me go to full screen here. There we go. Okay, thanks. That was great. I'm assuming everyone can hear and see me. So uh, a second case study will cover some of the same sorts of principles. And it's going to also include some of the cautions uh, about full eradication um, that we've come across. So uh, in addition to the principles that Steph outlined, um, at, we have similar information many others do for this species, which is uh, found to invade worldwide, um, but with also some caveats that would make uh, choosing that functional eradication level very important. So the European green crab has been a successful invader on five continents around the planet. As the name implies, it's native to much of Western Europe. Um, it invaded the uh, East Coast and then later the West Coast of the US, um, but has also successfully invaded uh, South America and Argentina, South Africa, uh, the Australian mainland. Um, so it's been very successful um, as an invader. It's had substantial economic and ecological impacts, um, best documented in North America on many native species. Um, it's had substantial fisheries law, um, consequences. It's, it's still re, uh, is resulting in $20 million every year of lost fishery income on the East Coast, uh, in particular areas like uh, shellfish producers on the Raleigh River in Massachusetts and other places like that and smaller losses in, in other locations. It's clearly amongst the world's 100 worst invaders. It really has caused very similar impacts wherever it's been introduced. It has been introduced on the West Coast, and I wanna talk just briefly about a very small uh, localized effort that we um, undertook to try to locally eradicate green crabs. And I wanted to use these data to sort of highlight an additional pitfall for uh, full eradication programs. This is just a snippet from a recent paper we had in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences that shows eradication over a five-year period. So we had a small embayment in Central California. I'm happy to answer questions about this. It's, it's well-documented. Where we reduced the population to you know, about less than 10% of what we initially started with over a five-year period. And then suddenly we had this reproductive explosion and the population went right back to where it was before. So we lost all the ground that we had um, undertaken, all the effort that we had put in for this eradication 
program, um, as you can see, the age structure was such that it was mostly adults in this uh, pre-eradication period. Of course, we're only harvesting adults. As with many or most eradication or control programs, it's very difficult to get small sizes of juveniles. Um, so in many cases, you're removing adults. Um, and what you see here in 2014 is this massive explosion. The population was almost entirely juveniles. And what had really happened was um, we had removed all the adults, most of the adults that we had removed control of these small sizes. So all the reproduction in that next year um, were, uh, were not um, consumed by adults. So green crabs, but like most crustaceans and many, many fishes um, will eat young, you know, the young uh, wherever they are. So again, this sort of we'll say cannibalism, if you will, is very common throughout many, many fishes, lots of crustaceans, lots of aquatic and marine species. And this was the key to explaining this overcompensatory um, reproduction. So this is that same curve that, um, that Steph showed you with uh, lionfish, this overcompensatory curve. And what we literally uh, found in our work was just that. So when we had reduced the, popu reduced the population down to this level, we had this massive increase in abundance and uh, a really great demonstration, unfortunately, of one of the pitfalls of trying to reduce or trying to eradicate a population entirely. So this will look very similar to what Steph showed you for the lionfish on this x-axis is the green crab. It's catch per unit effort. So we actually have data from some locations where we have specific densities where we can uh, analogize these with uh, or calibrate them with catch per unit effort. But this is trapping data as one typically has for mobile species like this. So on this axis is an index of density 10 to 40. And up here is a population change of native shellfish. So we're, this is a, a, a series of many different studies showing the relationship between green crab density and survival of native shellfish. Of course, at lower densities, you're getting more survival. And once again, this is a nonlinear relationship, just as we saw for lionfish. And the reproductive function is very much affected by that story I just showed you, that when you get to these very low densities of green crabs, you can have very high reproduction. So you want to avoid trapping down to that level if for no other reason than to avoid the overcompensatory effects. So we have this area here where we begin to get this flattened um, relationship with uh, increase in shellfish, native shell, excuse me, uh, shellfish density. So this 10 to 20 CPU area provides much of the benefit that you would like to re sort of basically getting higher shellfish uh, survival and again, down here, avoiding that overcompensatory relationship. So with fairly basic information, these metrics allow us to develop this target of about 10 to 20 green crabs in terms of catch per unit, that's sort of trapping per day uh, for green crabs. Now, this is now also being used for management of green crabs. This green crab um, has continued, the European green crab has continued its expansion throughout uh, the Pacific Northwest, Oregon, Washington, and into British Columbia. Here you can see this map of recent trapping data uh, from uh, Department of Fisheries and Oceans, uh, Tom Terrio and others. Here you can see uh, it's spreading out up into um, this area of British Columbia. It's still moving Northward, it's actually uh, on Haida Gwaii now. It hasn't quite made its way to Southeast Alaska, but should very soon. So this is very much an expanding invasion and they've increased abundances dramatically. Washington state has had a huge increase in the numbers of green crabs. In fact, in the Salish Sea area, both US tribal and Canadian First Nation areas um, have really been impacted. So. Uh, some of the native communities have really been experiencing uh, large, large increases in green crabs with consequences for small dungeness crabs uh, and shellfish in these areas. The state of Washington is now spending $7 million in this last year to manage green crab invasions. And the good news is the dialogue or the, um, the sort of the, the messages have now gone from, we're going to go get them and eradicate them to now discussing the use of our functional eradication approach. 
So uh, I think the, this idea that you need to reduce the impacts, but without having to redu remove every crab in the local area is really beginning to be taken on by uh, local management and beginning to, to make sense because people realize that they have the data to be able to develop targets uh, for functional eradication. Whoops, sorry about that. Hit the wrong button. So um, I'd like to sort of end with just sort of a view of this. The point that we'd like to make is, um, this is a point made by Bethany Bradley and her colleagues regarding this nonlinear relationship, because several of you are thinking, well, gee, this must be just specific to green crabs and lionfish and others. This is a synthesis of many, many studies showing this nonlinear relationship between a native species response and the abundance or density of non-native species or AIS invasive aquatic species here on this axis. So you can see this, this is a lot of different studies. This is a general relationship. So there are the opportunities for thresholds. Again, if this is a linear relationship, it doesn't matter what level you pick, more is better. But in this situation, there are thresholds as we explained where you would be best off to target your management actions. It's greater, it, the relationship is stronger for predators, a little bit less so for competitors, and really kind of not really so for, we'll say, uh, lower level invaders, you know, primary producers and things. But for a lot of the consumers that we've talked about, for many of the species that uh, you can imagine in aquatic systems, lots of fishes, lots of uh, crustaceans, crayfish, et cetera, this is going to be a very robust relationship and very useful for developing targets for functional eradication. Okay, well, we'd like to finish up with acknowledging lots of partners and lots of assistance, lots of funding sources, NSERC and NSF and Pacific States and um, uh, National Marine Fisheries, and lots and lots of help from the Aquatic Nuisance Species Task Force and the regional panels that help to provide uh, the capacity for undertaking the survey data. So I think at this point, we'll probably stop. And I think both Steph and I are happy to take questions, uh, which I think Christy will moderate. So I'm gonna give the screen back to Christy. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Ted and Stephanie. That was a great, Great presentation. Um, looks like we've got just a couple questions that came through in the chat, but feel free, um, anyone in the audience, to keep them coming. Um, the first question is kind of a three part question um, Is functional eradication a perpetual management scenario, meaning that we need to keep removing forever? And do you feel like that's a sustainable approach? Um, adding on to that, is it only viable for species with a market value? So could I, I'll, I'll take it and then maybe Steph will also answer that too on different levels. Um, yes, and I'll make two points. Uh, one is that um, there are many species for which the sort of, they're, they're continually being brought in. So even if you really truly eradicate a species, you may find in several years, oops, it gets introduced again. We've seen that with Calerpa. We've seen that with lots of others. Um, this will really work in places where it's a high priority species in a targeted area. We've been able to undertake eradication using citizen or community scientists. So we've actually been able to maintain a reduction or a, or a suppression program for now six or seven years using interested community scientists and volunteers. Of course, people in the audience are thinking, yeah, well, you're just going to, have to keep it going. But if it's a place, if it's a species, if it's you know a situation that local people care about, you'd be surprised. We've been having more volunteers than we can use to try to keep the green crab suppressed. So I think community and citizen science is the new direction, the new future for these kinds of programs to be maintained. And I'll let Steph take it also. Yeah, thanks for the question. I think too, another perspective is, you know, where where would this not be the approach? And um, the invasions that we've discussed are, are broadly distributed, well-established invasions um, for which, you know, those working in the system have 
identified that really there aren't the resources to achieve complete eradication. And so um, sometimes the conversation then needs to shift in terms of, okay, well, we, we know that might not be the goal. So what is the goal and how do we use these limited resources that we have to get the most bang for our buck basically. So um, we're not proposing this as an alternative to prevention or eradication where that's feasible, but it's sort of a pragmatic approach in the many cases where we do have a, a species that's that where that doesn't seem to be feasible with the technology or the effort that we have currently. And sustaining those efforts, as, as had mentioned, my experience has also been that thinking creatively about where the priority locations are and who the partners are that can engage in those suppression activities um, it has, been, has been really helpful, particularly in the context of lionfish, where, where do we, where do those who are most impacted by the invasion care about having that suppression done and, and what, are, what are the outcomes? I'll just add one or two things too, that that's great. Thanks very much, Steph. Um, I, I do wanna emphasize that eradication is, is, is more difficult than, than folks imagine, even probably in lake systems where you think, well, it's a, you know, kind of a, a fishbowl and we can go get them. I mean, the, there are at least a half a dozen really well-documented, although not experimental studies of trying to eradicate fishes in lake systems. Um, a famous one is the removal of smallmouth bass in upstate New York in Little Moose Lake. And they worked as hard as they could to remove smallmouth bass over a seven year period and had more than they started with. They actually demonstrated non-experimentally this overcompensation. So, you, so even if you think, well, we can get a handle on it, you may end up with that sort of result. So the point is, eradication can be very, very, very difficult to achieve full eradication. Um, it's only happened probably four or five times in coastal marine systems. So the point that Steph made, I would just wanna reiterate is that you have to accept that eradication is not likely in many situations. So then the question is, okay, what? And so you need to have a target for that, what? And I think this is really, uh, I think we think this is the best way forward. Awesome. Yeah. Um, Alan, do you want to unmute yourself? I see your hand raised. Yeah. Hi. <clears throat> Alan Ployce, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, so I, I'm curious, uh, Stephanie and Ted, why you chose the word eradication, functional eradication, rather than functional suppression or functional control. I find it kind of almost an you know, it's kind of a difficult concept for people to get wrap their heads around because it's sort of like saying functionally dead or, you know, it's, you know, it's not, it doesn't really, in my mind, it doesn't describe it, but I'm sure that there's a good scientific explanation why you chose to use it in that way. Go ahead, Steph. <laughs> Thanks for the question, Alan. And I recognize, you know, suppression is, uh, essentially what we're talking about guided by data data driven suppression um, I think you know from my perspective eradication and I, I'd be curious to know the thoughts of those on this call but from the interactions I've had eradication is the is the thing people want to talk about and it's a very um, desired property in the invasive species control world and I think the point we are trying to make is that, um, it's, it's about keeping the species essentially functionally eradicated. They're out, they're not playing the role in the system that they could at high densities. And so we're not necessarily suppressing the function. We're trying to aim for keeping that function completely out of the priority locations. And so that would be more in line with eradicating the function than just kind of keeping it suppressed. So that's my twofold answer, but I recognize Alan that, um, that it's that it is um, suppression is also a very key part of this because that's what's happening. I, I agree, I, and I the the it's the functional portion to think about. We're eradicating the function, but I have had several other people with your comment over the last few months. So um, yeah. So that just uh, follow up in in your definition of functional because a lot of people are gonna, are asking me as I'm managing green crab when do I meet the functional level? How do I measure that I'm actually achieving functional eradication? Is that 
a scientific value? Is that a community value? What, what is it? And how do I get it? Yeah. I, I think, I mean, I, you know, the models that we showed suggest if you can eradicate, if you can, excuse me, suppress down to a level, you'll get your hopefully ecosystem function native species back to a level that would be acceptable. So um, that's what we're trying to advocate. So that's that's the level, I'm hoping that's answering your question. So it's, a, it's an ecological metric, that's what we're hoping to do. And in fact, I'm gonna have a conversation with uh, Emily and Sean uh, next week be, to look at their data, which they have to actually help identify what that target is. Yeah. Right. So so in Washington state, we have kind of two different things. One is we have a very you know, good, robust early detection network where there are places where we have hundreds of green crab a year that are captured, which is very, very low. And we try to manage that down to a level where we have single digit numbers of crab that are being caught. And then we sort of gauge our management based on that. And at some point we say, we're making, we're meeting this functional eradication because, you know, we're catching maybe a handful of crabs over a geographic area, but there is no ecological impact that we're measuring. We're just measuring the number of species that we're getting. And then there are other areas that we're going to be dealing with that do have larger numbers of crab, but measuring the ecological impact obviously costs money. And you know, there's this point where we're still, we feel like we're still at the advanced edge of the uh, invasion curve where the impacts are not necessarily measurable yet. And we're trying to prevent that. So we're, we're really looking at the numbers of crabs versus the ecological impacts to gauge functional eradication. Is that how would you yeah let, let me take this i mean so the the impacts that i know of the data that i guess emily and sean have are on dungeness crabs so the idea would be to look at the impacts say on dungeness crabs as the example um, i'm going to share my screen for just a second um, if no one minds just to sort of show you what i mean by where those two examples alan that you suggested are on the curve so if i could share for just a second here um, I'm going to go back to this diagram very quickly. And uh, can everybody see this? I'm hoping, yes. Or shake your head. Yes. Definitely. Yes. So if you look at this curve in the lower right, uh, I don't think I have an arrow that you can see, but you can see that this solid curve, Alan, um, in most situations, your numbers are way to the left here, almost near the origin, because the numbers of crabs that I've seen from Sean and and um, Emily are numbers per hundred traps, like single digits per hundred traps. You guys are really, really on the low part. So you can see that's the rising part, this left portion of the curb. So you're right, more is better. You can go trap all day and you're, way, you're much far below this worry about overcompensation. So at these very low densities should be all systems go to try to suppressed to try to you know keep the population from spreading or moving anywhere else if you are in this large this high density area maybe you know the lummy sea ponds or something like that way much further out where there may be an impact then those impacts would be would need to take into consideration the possibility of getting some sort of overcompensatory response if you have very high densities in but i think in general you're much further over here and you have nothing to worry about, so you could just move ahead and try to keep things at, at a low level. I'm gonna stop sharing here, okay. So I think we're back to it, is that right? Good, thanks. Does that help? Um, and that's, I think, where we're with that, okay. Yeah, I, I think, you know, in, in our management scheme, we, we do, we have not yet put in the science or the monitoring on the ecological impacts. And, you know, we're, we're mostly focused on getting rid of crab, but I, I see that we need to, in the long term, start dealing more with the ecological aspect and being able to- But I think to, you know, also have trapping data on Dungeness crabs, correct? That are sort of just, that go along with this. Is that right? I believe that was- the Well, the, you know, maybe Sean and Emily have that, I don't. Um, and I would say, I wouldn't, again, you know, what we're looking at is, 
impacts to what our, our Dungeness crab fishery. You know, how, how do you determine that compared to, uh, you know, ocean acidification and, and warming and, and other pieces in there? Um, and then, you know, the predation is like, well, do, how can we really measure predation on juvenile Dungeness crab that could be happening out there? So those are all speculative things that I need to be thinking about. How, how do I start putting those metrics into our process? Alan, I want to just circle back to what you said initially about like, what is the what is the impact on and who decides that? I think uh, in your case for green crab, perhaps it, you know, it, it would depend on the resource and the data that from elsewhere that's been invaded as to what the impacts are likely to be. But I've seen in some other projects I've been involved with that what that currency is, what the what the concern is differs depending on, you know, who who is evaluating um, what the important part of the resource is. And so um, you know, in, in some places I've worked, particularly for lionfish, it's it's nursery habitats that have certain species sets that would be a priority for marine protected area management. In other places, it's commercially valuable species in the system, and it could even be sort of um, a, an ac economic based, you know, um, indicator of impact. And so, I think what we're advocating for, though, is for gathering data. Um, to generate that relationship between density of the invader and whatever that component is and on a gradient. And typically what we see in some places is either data gathered as, you know, presence or absence of the invader. And then we're not really able to look at what the relationship is with density to know where the, when the impacts are likely to start happening. So if there's any opportunity to gather those information together and think about it in that way, it's really helpful for trying to just plot up the data and see what, if there is a relationship that you can discern. There, there, there are opportunities perhaps to look at impacts on other things, as you know, probably from other studies, they have impacts on uh, seagrasses, which can be very important. They can also have big impacts on shellfish. So that information could come from shellfish producers and growers. In other words, it doesn't necessarily need to be gathered by WDFW. So there may be opportunities as time goes on to look at you know, impacts uh, using other data sets and other other things. As Steph said, it depends on what's important to, you know, depending on where you are. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks. And yeah, you'll see that. Yeah, Matt, go ahead. Feel free to unmute. I'll give it a shot. I'm going to leave my video off because I think I'm getting that really fun internet unstable warning over here. But um, as we were looking through some of these examples, I was thinking about some of the species that have been a priority for the COP and things like crayfish and bullfrogs and you know how these relationships are probably gonna be different for all the species that we're talking about. And what I was thinking about a lot during the presentation was crayfish and like, is eradication of crayfish gonna be possible in Arizona? And kind of, what do we know about those? And I, I don't know that folks are, I'm sure everybody's prepared to answer this real time here, but, um, it's something I think I'm thinking about, so I dropped that question in the chat. Um, so if folks wanted to jump on and respond to that, feel free here or drop it in the chat, or we can uh, discuss at a later COP call to you. But I'm thinking about the level of information we'd have to even make some of those decisions uh, to be in a lion, fish, or green crab type situation. But um, yeah, anyway, I'll stop rambling. That was my question, Christy. Thanks, Matt. Do you want to take that stuff or I was trying to get the uh, the fee paper up. Uh, so just to address that, Matt, um, we actually have data. I'm going to show this specifically and um, Steph may have the original um, photo. Um, so let me just share screens just a second. Unless you can un I'll unshare for if you want to do this. I hope everyone can see this. So Matt, we actually literally included rusty crayfish in our analysis in this paper. So we have exactly the same kind of result for crayfish. So we have sort of a recommended um, sort of reduction target for species like crayfish. So the answer is yes. And I think um, Steph will probably reiterate this, that that's certainly the type of species that we think that this framework would, would do really well with. So um, it has the same kind of information available. So that I realize that's just one crayfish, invasive crayfish species, there are many. But uh, does, does that help with that? And um, Steph will probably weigh in to provide some.
Yeah, I think I, it sounds like the question is also just generally for the group and it might be something where, um, you know, there are data, I think in our survey, what we found was that many people identified that those data sets, relevant data sets had been gathered, but maybe not collated in, in this way before. And so, you know, questions like yours, Matt, are a really useful one to think about like, well, who might have the data? Is it maybe for a, a not necessarily the focal geographic area, but could it a related one? And um, either the same or a similar species. And obviously, you know, the more, the more place and species specific, the data on that density impact relationship could be gathered from control efforts and recolonization following removal, that, that's great, but it might be that there's an opportunity to apply data gathered elsewhere to just kind of get a ballpark of what you might, you might aim for in terms of removal. Um, so we, uh, we kind of combed the literature, combed data sets that were available for rusty crayfish in relation to some native fish species that there were some impacts demonstrated for, but what that density impact relationship is might differ for your region, depending on what the target, um, the, the valued resource component is. Thank you, that was, that was really helpful. And um, I do wanna see those data, those charts. Um, so I'll make sure that I follow up and, and can track those down. Um, I'm always full of questions, but kind of related to, okay. So if we have that information, uh, one thing we've talked about is how do we convey, convey to leadership of our organizations and agencies that control is needed and that it justifies the, the investment. Um, do you feel like it's a harder sell to talk about this functional eradication versus something that's more maybe tangible to leadership? Like, oh, we're gonna get rid of all of these creatures and be able to walk away. I'm just curious if you've gotten uh, feedback um, that would be, yeah, associated with that. Yeah, I could give a sort of um, some anecdotes from my experience, uh, but I, I think that some ways that we have, you know, there were, again, I'll go back to the lionfish because it's the case study I'm most intimately involved with right now. But, um, you know, there were some studies that came out saying, well, you know, the population models saying, oh, we'd have to remove so many lionfish, but, you know, we're never going to eradicate them. And there was kind of a ripple through the community that was like, well, should we even try? Um, but there are also data su to suggest that there were um, some strong impacts that would occur at high densities. And so it was a case of communicating what the impacts could be. And then the other argument was to be able to say, well, we'd be able to cover a larger area with control if we're reallocating some of those resources instead of trying to get every single individual from a few spots, we could reallocate control over a broader area and achieve benefits for more places is another, is another way that we've been able to communicate the potential value of this type of a strategy um, in the context of a, a broadly distributed invader that's, that's pretty abundant. Um, so that's, that's the way we've been able to communicate the benefits of this strategy. I, yeah, I think it's really, really important to keep in mind, it can be extremely expensive and time consuming to get those last few individuals. So, um, you know, it could be there's, I think there's a real need for economic analysis of this. And there's a couple models and some folks have been sort of continuing to work on this. Um, but I think that's that's really important. What Steph said is being able to sort of broadly distribute a modest effort over a larger area rather than focusing all your dollars on the last few individuals may actually be quite equivalent. Awesome, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you both for the explanation. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and close this out. This has been a great conversation. Um, but we are at the top of the hour and I want to respect everyone's time. Uh, so thank you everyone for taking the time to join us. Um, as we said before, this webinar was recorded and we will make it available on our YouTube channel. Um, and Matt, if you have a chance to put that link in the chat, that would be great. You can also find all of our previous webinars there. Um, I also encourage you all to visit CCAST and our case study dashboard where we currently have 144 case studies on various topics.
Also, next month um, for our next webinar will be on May 24th, and we're going to be hosting a webinar by Carol Pacey from Marsh and Associates on the Sharing Tales program, which is an Arizona program that promotes education on native fishes in schools across the state. We're always working on lining up more webinar speakers, um, so if you would like to receive our webinar announcements and are already on our mailing list, please just let us know. Thank you again all for your time and thank you especially to Ted and Stephanie um, for joining us and giving this excellent presentation. We hope you all have a great day. Thanks for the invitation.